<laughs> thank you very much, Per. Um, so um, thank you all for this opportunity, too. I really appreciate this. Um, so real quick uh, on who I am. Um, I have a tendency to kind of approach this whole thing as an academic, so I really apologize in advance uh, to everybody here. Um, but um, I do believe in learning by doing. Uh, so I'm an active member of uh, the team, uh, John Ripper Passive Cracking Team, and I uh, compete in all the competitions that we have. Um, I also really enjoy more standard, um, you know, pen testing, red teaming uh, types of exercises as well. Uh, so I uh, compete in a lot of different uh, capture the flag events as well. Um, probably the, the top one that I did though was uh, my team made it into the DEF CON capture the flag finals, which was a real surreal experience. Uh, because I don't know if you've been to Vegas there, but uh, basically they put you all in the middle of a room, kind of like a zoo or something like that there, and then all the people come around and point at you as you're trying to Google, you know, you know command line arguments and stuff like that. Um, <laughs> So um, my day job, this is, this is actually um, a, a hobby of mine, uh, so I don't really do any password cracking um, at all. And so once again, I had to put a little disclaimer there saying that, you know, this is not my employer, this is me that's saying everything here. Um, do, during, in my day job, though, I'm focusing more on medical device security, and that's just a really interesting field. And I really love it, too, because, um, you know, a lot of times you, you have a job, and it's like, okay, you know, are we really making the world a better place? And it's really nice to be able to kind of do this type of work here and say, nope, no, we're actually really trying to protect people's uh, lives here. Now, um, if you get outside of work and you know, pass and cracking and stuff like that there too, I really do enjoy backpacking and hiking. And so about four years ago, um, I also took off seven months from my job and I ended up through hiking the Appalachian Trail. So I started in Georgia and I finished in Maine there. Uh, so if you ever want to you know, talk about hiking there uh, and embracing the suck, uh, I will definitely be able to um, um, talk about that at length. So probably the, the really first question that people have, though, is when we say, you know, what is PCFG uh, password cracking? You know, they ask, you know, what does that PCFG stand for there? Uh, so, I mean, the technical, oh, you know, that was too a little fast there. So the technical answer is, you know, it's a probabilistic context-free grammar. So if you're really into, you know, Siri Autonoma or, you know, you're a formal language nerd, like, you know, um, maybe a, a few people back there, uh, this might actually mean something to you. Uh, but for most people, they see that uh, name there and they're like, oh, God, it's mass. I can't stand that. And it's like, you yeah, know, whatever. Uh, so I like mass. I think that's awesome. Uh, but... Uh, Basically, I kept on getting that reaction there, so I decided I went ahead to go, go ahead and rename this. So right now, it actually stands for Pretty Cool Fuzzy Fuzzer Guesser there, okay? And by the way, this is my favorite slide I've ever made in my life here, so it's all downhill from now. So, um, but this is probably a better e explanation of, you know, what we're actually doing here. Uh, we're trying to do kind of fuzzy guessing on how to create these password guesses. And another way of kind of putting this here is that we're using machine learning. And when I say machine learning, I mean machine learning in the you know, traditional sense of like a whole bunch of if-then statements. Uh, so basically, uh, we're not using neural networks or anything else along those lines. Uh, but what it, um, this allows us to do, though, is uh, we can take a uh, train on these disclosed password lists. So you have a, a list of all these different passwords. Um, you use this tool in order to go ahead and parse these passwords. And then it basically generates a probability model for how it expects people to create passwords based upon this training set. And when, once you have this probability model, what this really allows you to do is crack passwords the same way that we talk about cracking passwords. Because we all talk about, oh yeah, people have a tendency to use you know, their names or their pets or you know, um, you know, family members or they use uh, you know, birth dates uh, uh, their, as their numbers. They have a tendency to capitalize the first letter versus the last letter. Um, and we, uh, we use sports teams. And so you really want to go ahead and you know, prioritize how you go ahead and incorporate that data in your cracking session. But you also want to go ahead and try kind of the less you know, likely things as well, because cracking one, two, three, four, five, six gets really boring really easy. That's, that's the easy one to do. Uh, but you might want to go ahead and try like a really common word, uh, like a, you know, someone's football team, uh, but then try a much less likely uh, you know, mangling rule on that as well. So trying to figure out how you go ahead and structure those different rules together uh, is really kind of the core idea, uh, idea behind using PCFGs. So the original version of this here was actually developed back in 2008 um, when I was a graduate student at Florida State University. I had the, the really nice opportunity to be able to work in our eCrimes Investigative Technologies Lab, ESIT Lab. Um, and basically, uh, this was uh, funded and uh, you know, uh, done under research here for the National Institute of Justice at uh, the America. 
and a National White Collar Crime Center. Uh, so the real goal here was to be able to develop better tools for law enforcement to be able to crack passwords. And there's still a lot of that focus there, I would say, as well um, um, with this. Now that was, you know, over 11 years ago. So this tool's been out in the wild for quite a while. And I've, you know, published papers because, you know, I'm an academic. Uh, so other people have gone ahead and developed their own tools as well. So if you're interested in the actual, you know, Florida's uh, FSU ESET lab program there, uh, that is um, pretty much only available for law enforcement. But if you're involved with that there, please go ahead and reach out to Sudhir um, Agarwal, and uh, he, um, um, he will be able to help you out with that there. For this talk, though, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about uh, these two different tool sets that I maintain currently right now and are available on GitHub. So whenever, whenever we talk about this here, that's really what I'm going to focus on. But there's a lot of other cool implementations out there, too. So part of the reason why I kind of want to give this talk, though, um, is because I just released a new version of this tool. And for this, I really have to blame Per. Uh, because last year, he was asking me, like, hey, do you want to go ahead and present this uh, passwords con? And I was like, Sweden's a far away, a long way away, uh, you know, and I haven't really done a lot. Because, you know, you have a t um, you know, research project they've been working on for, you know, 11 years. There's times that you work on it a lot, and then there's a whole big period of time when you, you know, want to watch Netflix or something like that. <laughs> so um, he was, you know, bugging me about this, and I was like, you know, I really should go ahead and implement some new features. Maybe I can go ahead and release a new version before PasswordsCon. Uh, so, you know, my typical, you know, programming uh, style here, um, I did not release a new tool before last year's passwords con, uh, and I ended up having a huge uh, case of feature creep, where basically I started saying like, "Oh, this whole code sucks." I you know, was tearing it out. I was like, "I want to add this new algorithm," so I was putting in uh, new stuff into it there, and I ended up completely rewriting the tool set from scratch, pretty much. Um, so I finally was able to release it about two months ago, uh, and so. Where the, the kind of focus on this here, though, was I really wanted to go ahead and move this tool out of academia and make it more useful for real world use cases. Um, there's a lot of new modeling features I want to add into this as well, and I'll talk about a few of them today. And then I also wanted to be able to go ahead and some better support other cracking techniques as well. Uh, so in case you didn't want to go ahead and use the, you know, the PCFG tool set itself, um, I'm, I have all this probability data that I'm using for parsing these password data sets. So it'd be really nice to be able to go ahead and incorporate this probability data in my more traditional word mangling uh, rules, uh, rules that I would be doing uh, for other uh, cracking techniques. Uh, another part of the reason why I kind of want to do this talk too, uh, this is actually the GitHub uh, page. I have a, a, you know, a projects page on there that kind of details what I'm currently working on if you ever want to go to it. And pretty much the top one in my to-do list here is update PCFG documentation. I always fail at that. I hate writing documentation. Uh, so hopefully this will be able to provide a little bit of documentation right now uh, for how to actually go about using this tool. Also, I want to point out that this is still under active development. Uh, there's a whole lot of things in my to-do list here, if you, you might notice. Uh, so what's really useful for me is if uh, for comments back on people who might actually be using this tool about features they're really interested in. So that way I can move it closer up to the top of my to-do list or maybe add new things to that as well. So uh, PCFGs have been pretty popular in kind of the academic setting. Uh, so this is a Google Scholar. It's basically the Instagram for academics. It's just instead of uh, <laughs> likes, uh, everyone you know, kind of focuses on their citations instead. Uh, so the top two results from doing ser searching for password cracking, at least when I did it, it'll change depending on who else does it here, uh, is the original pa uh, PCFG paper, uh, which was cited by 366 people, and then a paper by CMU where, where they were comparing different password cracking uh, algorithms. And one of them was uh, you know, the PCFG as well, which was also cited by even more people, 377. Um, everyone loves those cup labs. Uh, so what's really cool about this, though, is when I talk about how effective this is or you know, different you know, aspects of trying to do this modeling here, I don't actually have to draw any of the graphs because I can just go ahead and go into everybody else's paper and you know, uh, grab their research instead. Um, and that's really kind of be all nice when I be able, able to talk to you about you know, why you might be, want to be interested in uh, PCFG password cracking. Uh, now, one thing I really kind of want to be upfront about, though, is if you look at all these academic papers, you'll notice something that kind of really stands out. And that is, they really represent only very short cracking sessions. Because you know, if you're not in password cracking, and you say, oh, wow, they made you know, one trillion guesses. That sounds like a lot. Uh, but when you start looking at some of these different GPU-based attacks or something like that, you're doing that in like seconds. Uh, you, uh, so uh, PCFGs, uh, there's a lot of computational overhead in that there. And that really does slow down your attack. Um, so 
If you're trying to go ahead and crack like NTLM hashes or you know, raw MD5, this is probably not the attack for you. You want to be able to throw something at that can really keep your GPU happy. Uh, where this is really nice, though, is when you're trying to attack you know, computationally expensive hashes, like file encryption. And in that case there, the cost of making the guess is so high uh, that uh, this becomes less of a bottleneck as far as how big long you can run your cracking session. So I want to kind of go into this uh, CMU paper here um, real quick here before I start diving into um, this tool set a little bit more, though. And the reason why I want to do this here is because there's always kind of a question, especially when you start talking about academic research, of how well does this represent reality? You know, do these grad students actually have the skills of a professional password cracker when they start doing this modeling here? <coughs> and so this paper that CMU uh, came out with here, um, they took a really kind of interesting approach. And so they compared different types of cracking styles. Uh, but one thing they did was that they got a, um, a, res uh, a, a security professional from CoreLogic to run a real password cracking attack as well and to go ahead and model the results of that. And um, if you're not aware of CoreLogic, they're the people that run, you know, crack me if you can at the DEF CON competition there. So um, I think it's fair to say that they're actually, you know, can be considered, you know, um, uh, pretty good uh, when it comes to uh, password cracking. And we ran this attack um, uh, when CMU modeled it here uh, for pretty much the, you know, the first trillion guesses. Um, the PCFG was doing way better than uh, the professional password cracker by trying to go ahead and create these guesses by hand. Now, when he started going ahead and giving them, you know, t this is a log, uh, logarithmic scale, so they had 10 more times you know, the guesses, they did eventually you know, go ahead and beat it. Um, but <coughs> this is kind of really cool, though, in the fact that you don't have to have any skill. You just need to train it on a good data set. And you can have a cracking session that probably mimics or is, is, is roughly about as good as probably a real professional you know, uh, attacker here. So this is really good if you're start going ahead and staying up a uh, forensics shop and you may not have a professional password cracker on your staff, uh, but they can do a pretty good job there when it comes to um, actually uh, cracking passwords. Oh, yeah. So one other thing I just kind of want to point out here, first of all, though, is that uh, Academia is cool, and one cool thing about academia, though, is the ability to go ahead and influence change in the real world. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with uh, NIST uh, special publication 863B for digital authentication. Um, if you read uh, any of the older versions of it, you know, the gold, good old hits, uh, they had this huge section talking about you know, password entropy and saying that if you use these you know, uh, character creation rules and you know, force users to have special characters and you made their passwords you know, 14 characters or 15 characters long, it would give you a certain number of entropy bits and it would be equivalent to like a really long key. And it was kind of really pushing people to make longer and more complex passwords. So the updated version is much better. They got rid of that whole thing of password entropy there. Uh, and when talking about composition rules, they said in the, the official documentation, the most notable form of these is composition rules, which requires the user to choose passwords constructed using a mix of character types, such as least one digit, uppercase letter, and symbol. However, analysis of breached password databases revealed that the benefit of such rules is not nearly as significant as initially sought. Also, also the impact of usability and memorability is severe. And they, uh, they uh, referenced our paper because what we did was we ran uh, you know, PCFG attacks against a bunch of different password creation rules and showed that entropy really had no basis in reality. So kind of going back to Perez earlier talk though, also about password change policies. What are we doing about that? Everyone hates you know, password change policies. Well, the FTC came out and they had a great, great paper by Lori Kramer that came out and said, you know, maybe we should really Resync password change policies. Maybe we shouldn't have force users to change their password. And as part of that, uh, she cited a paper, uh, The Security of Modern Password Expiration, uh, by some University of North Carolina researchers, where they went ahead against their university's um, uh, own students there, because they had all the access to all that data. And they had about 10,000 defunct um, accounts they went ahead and tried to crack. And of those 10,000 accounts, they were able to crack about 7,700 uh, of those accounts at least one of those passwords. And then they started cracking it even more to figure out whether that password that they had just cracked there would be allow them to go ahead and crack the new password. And they found, yes, it does. You know, if you crack one password, you can pretty much crack all their other passwords pretty easily. And for that paper, uh, these researchers used probably one of the earliest versions of uh, the, uh, the PCFG cracker there. Um, and they said that, you know, the dictionary-based approach was most effective, especially when combined with the word list generating methods of, you know, the PCFG. So once again, this is one thing I just wanted to really kind of, you know, uh, be really happy about is that this is making your lives less 
you know, complex when it comes to passwords here. So that way we can focus on things like password reuse um, and you know, combating the real threats that users have to face. So all that's the kind of the background. Now I really kind of want to focus though on how do you actually go about using this tool set. And so I'm going to start out with the, go, uh, the Python tool set um, um, that's uh, available here. So the first thing you need to do is be able to go get it so you can get off GitHub. And as far as requirements in order to run it, really it's only Python 3. If you can run Python uh, on in that, uh, you know, a system, you can pretty much run this tool set here. I've tried it on a bunch of different variations of Linux. It runs on Windows. I even tried it on NetBSD, and it was about the only thing I've ever gotten to run on NetBSD. <laughs> um, so I mean, uh, there's not a whole lot of requirements in order to actually install and run this here at all. Now, one thing I want to really stress, though, is that this is only a password guest generator. This will not crack any passwords on its own. So what you, if you really want to crack passwords, you also need to go ahead and have a password cracking tool of choice installed on that computer as well, like John Ripper or Hashcat. And I'm going to use all John Ripper examples because you know, Hashcat's definitely had a good representation here. And you know, I got to show some love to John. Um, so the only other thing is just kind of an optional um, if you, uh, for training of data sets. Um, there's this uh, Python car, car, car debt, uh, module. And basically, this helps you auto detect what the character encoding the, the training set is. Because uh, character encoding is like the bane of my password cracking existence here. Uh, so that helps at least reduce a little bit of the, you know, the stress of being able to do that. And I'll talk about that more when I talk about training. So one thing I want to really stress, though, because I was mentioning earlier, it's slow. Uh, the, the guesser is single threaded CPU bound. So yes, it, obviously it's going to be slow just based upon that. I will make full use of that CPU, uh, but you know, you're not going to make use of any sort of GPU or parallelization or anything else really along those lines there. Also, it has very high RAM use. Um, and the RAM use will continue to grow as it runs because the data structures is keeping track of just keep on going bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, so I could have spent some time trying to do some more memory management. And I said, eh, I'll just map, make people throw more RAM at the problem, uh, because that's cheap. Uh, so I mean, it, it'll start out not too bad. But uh, you know, for longer cracking sessions, I'd recommend at least 16 gigs dedicated directly to this tool here. So the next thing kind of is you need to start generating these guesses. Uh, so um, the first choice you need to make, though, is what rule set do you want to use in order to generate these guesses based upon? Because this is, as I said, kind of machine learning. So you can have different rule sets depending on which target you're currently trying to target there. The default rule set in included with the tool is trained on 1 million passwords from the Rock U data set. So take that as you will. You know, it's your typical online users there from back in you know, circa uh, you know, 2008 or so. Uh, so. But you can definitely go ahead and have you know, trained on new data sets and select those as well. And I apologize in advance, I'll use rule set and grammar interchangeably depending on, you know, um, usually uh, however I'm feeling right now. Uh, but basically they're the same thing. So once you have that though, you just go ahead and start generating uh, guesses. So um, the, the one script in, in this in order to generate guesses is pcfg underscore guesser dot pi. So uh, that should be hopefully somewhat obvious. Uh, but you just run it as Python there. And it'll have two main flags. You don't have to add these here, uh, but I usually recommend them. <coughs> one is just the name of the rule set that you want to go ahead and generate guesses with. And then also, I'd recommend you know, including a session name as well, So because currently it allows you to you know, stop or restart a session. So even if you don't think you're ever going to want to restart it again, it's sometimes nice to have a unique session ID, because you know, you, you know, a couple days later, you realize, oh, maybe I do want to go ahead and keep on uh, that session going there. Uh, so I recommend having that and you know, making that unique per sessions as well. So that's great to just generate guesses, but now you really want to crack passwords. In order to do that, you need to have a password cracking program. So with um, most of these uh, different uh, programs, Hashcat and John the Ripper, um, they allow you to go ahead and generate guesses and pipe it in versus uh, in via standard in. Uh, so what you do with this is you go ahead and run uh, the tool set. Uh, you give a pipe to it there, and then you use a flag like in John, standard in. Um, and John will still start processing the input to, from this here to, like you would have a, like, a normal word list or something like that. Now, one problem with going ahead and running a cracking session when you're using something for uh, piping in versus standard in is that these tools will you often give you a great status report if you hit the enter button. But when you're running standard in, uh, you, know, you hit that enter button, it doesn't go to John Ripper or Hashcat. That, that enter goes to my, my tool. So if you really want to be able to go ahead and see the current status of uh, your cracking session, 
at least with John Ripper, what you can do is you can find the process ID of the John Ripper process itself, and then go ahead and send a, a, a sig user one signal to it by doing kill dash sig user one and then the PID of the John Ripper process. And so from a different window. And then when it does that there, you know, you'll get a pop out here and then you can see like, you know, how many number of hashes that you cracked, um, as well as, you know, the, the current guessing speed it's guessing guesses at there. So in this case, it's about, um, uh, you know, four million guesses a second. So it, it's slow, but you know, it's not horribly slow at least. Now I want to kind of take that window there though and go expand on, on that a little bit there. If I only had to give one slide for this entire talk, I would spend this entire talk right on this one slide here. Uh, because I think this really kind of shows, you know, the, the advantage of going ahead and using kind of a PCFG approach here. Because these, these are the passwords that is currently cracking. And you can see kind of here, and I apologize for the people in the back, uh, but you know, it's trying a whole bunch of different rules. And the great thing about these rules is I didn't have to write them by ma manually by hand. Because if you're doing any password cracking, especially when you're generating these rules here, like, oh, you know, I need to start combining these rules. So, okay, I want to capitalize the first letter and then add special character and then some digits and so on. And that just gets, gets very difficult here. Uh, so it's kind of fun when I look at these sections here to try to figure out, you know, how did it generate this guess? You know, what kind of micro rule did it use? So at the top here, you know, I can see that it's trying, you know, five letters and, you know, four digits in order to uh, generate, crack these passwords. But I want to specify that it's not trying all five digit words. It's not trying all four digit numbers. It's trying uh, those no uh, words of a certain probability. So it might try you know, a four digit num uh, like or, uh, a word like love or something like that before it tries a word like share. Uh, so you might see that cracked earlier in the cracking session before it gets to these things here. So if we keep on going down here, you know, we see you know, Cess is cool got cracked. You are cool, Cess, if you're watching. Um, but um, in this one here, this was a multi-word. So instead of going ahead and just going ahead and uh, trying you know, something that's in your dictionary, it'll combine words as well. So, in, and I'll make this distinction a little bit here. Instead of breaking this up as like Cess is cool as three different words, uh, what this is really doing underneath the hood here is just trying Cess and then the kind of the, the combination is cool uh, because that way it can quickly iterate between things. So it can then try like you know Adam is cool, Bob is cool, and so on. Uh, because uh, that is cool is kind of a, uh, you know, a common occurrence. So it goes down here a little bit further and it kind of looks like it's doing brute force. And when I actually dug into it, it, it wasn't doing brute force. It was actually just combining things like a prince attack. So if you've ever seen prince before, it's kind of a combinator. It throws a bunch of stuff at the wall and sees you know, what works. And so that's really what it's kind of switching off to right there. But then it tried like two different kind of fairly neat rules where it's trying special characters of equal types around each one there. So once again, you know, is this in your password cracking rule set normally? Well, it learned it automatically by training it on the data set here. And it, it, I could just, as I said, I could go through all this here, you know, but even like splitting down here, you know, we have things like fingernail and 99, and those might be in your rule set, but in this case here, when I dug into it, these were multi-words again. So it was trying, you know, finger plus nail and then 90 plus nine. And then, uh, you know, getting down here, it did, didn't just finally decide to go ahead and try, you know, um, uh, it's 69 settings, so it's, it did two digits uh, you know, uh, in front of it with a capitalized word. Um, and then finally, kind of at the bottom here, you're seeing even more combinations. So it's trying like multi-words uh, plus two digits. So like wood, fish, 39, and Tara, Don, 84. So you can kind of see how it starts going ahead and doing this. And now, also one thing I want to point out is this is about 12 minutes into the cracking session here. So all the really common passwords have already been done. So this is why we're starting to get into more kind of esoteric rules because it's already tried, you know, password 123 and 123456. So that's kind of a, what the PCFG is actually doing there. So when you do hit enter though, um, I did spend some time to try to go ahead and provide a useful status output to you as well. So that way you don't have to kind of reverse engineer it. You can kind of really see what the PCFG uh, guesser is doing at that time when you hit the enter key. So these are, I hit the enter key twice, so these are two different status outputs. Uh, but in this first one here, you can uh, see that it's actually doing a multi-word guessing again. So it's trying the 143rd most common word in the front. It's doing no capitalization to it there. And then it's trying the 93rd most common word at the back. So it gets down to that level of fine detail there when it comes to generating these guesses. And in this case, the example would be like uh, Kira and Ivan. 
Now, this next time I'm going to hit enter here, uh, we can see that it swapped over though, and this is about a minute afterwards. So I hit enter about, you know, um, you know, about 60 seconds afterwards. And it's now performing a brute force guess using the Omen uh, ordered Markov uh, uh, enum enumerator. So it's swapped between those two different guesses, just in that, the, the, the guessing strategy is just in that period of time. And if you keep on hitting enter, you'll keep on seeing it go um, around. So I did also, because I hate documentation, I tried to put documentation into the code as well. Uh, so if you hit H instead of enter, it'll bring up a status report help of what all these different things here in the status report means. And it actually just help is way longer because it goes into the details of what these individual rule sets mean as well. But I figured I'd just cut that off uh, for this presentation. But the one thing I really kind of wanted to highlight here is this kind of last option, which is probability coverage. And so when you hit enter, you'll see it's probability co coverage um, um, basically metric. And so one thing, and the reason why I add this here is that you always have to figure out when do you want to go ahead and abandon a current attack and try something new. Uh, so you've been running this for you know, the last week. You haven't cracked the password you're trying to target. You know, should you move on to another case? Should you go ahead and you know, just kill this and try some handcrafted mangling rules or whatever? And so this stats report and this probability coverage here tries to give you an idea about that. So what it does, it says it's an expected chance that a password would have been guessed at this point um, during the cracking session. And I want to stress, I mean, this is a fuzzy metric since it assumes that the target password exactly matches the probability of the train set. And the short answer is it doesn't. So, you know, this, this metric here will not be accurate fully. But at the very least, though, it gives you a good rule of sum to say, OK, you know, it's, we've covered like 90% of the key space it expects here. This will basically run forever. Uh, it will never pretty much run out of guesses ever, um, that way. But if you get like 90% or something like that, you might want to go ahead and just kill this off because every single guess it's making after this here is, is lower and lower and lower probability. Uh, so um, at that point there, I would probably recommend you know, changing it. And then if you really want to go back to it, you have to save session so you can go ahead and restore it at a later point. So one kind of usage tip, because I want to kind of focus on actually using this tool too. Um, and this is something that I just never really um, you know, bothered with uh, uh, fixing here. Uh, but if this is gener generating guesses way faster than you are hashing those guesses, um, this status output will generally hang. It, will, it won't actually bring up because it doesn't bother you to even check to see whether you hit the enter key because it's too busy uh, trying to output guesses and getting blocked by uh, your standard in. And so this happens quite a bit though if you're trying to crack like a bunch of bcrypt hashes uh, because you're making you know, five guesses a second or something like that. Um, and so that, that will get blocked there because it's trying to make you know, a million guesses a second. So that's, that's kind of my to-do list is to make that a little bit more um, uh, easy to use there. So as I was talking about multi-word detection, this is probably the, the most effective feature that I've added in this 4.0 uh, rewrite here. Um, I've I added a lot of other things as well, uh, but when I started seeing you know, what passwords am I cracking now versus earlier, uh, most of them were coming from the multi-word feature. So this was actually a really huge improvement uh, for uh, the accuracy of this here. So originally I was uh, inspired by the, uh, the work of the detect multi-words uh, by uh, Sign uh, in a, the crack staple uh, a tool set that he released there. Uh, because one of the hard problems was trying to you know, figure out from a training set, from a machine learning perspective, if something's a multi-word or not, um, it, it's, it's hard to do because you can have like an input dictionary and compare it against it and try to break it up, but you get a lot of false positives. And also, you, now you have to maintain this input dictionary. So now a new Pokemon character comes out or something like that, and you want to be able to detect it in your, your training set, you got to go ahead and ma manage that. And that's a huge pain. And also, this becomes very um, language specific as well. So now I have to maintain a, you know, an input dictionary for you know, Swedish, I need to have one for English, I need to have one for uh, Mandarin, and so on. And I really didn't want to do that. So I spent a lot of time here trying to figure out, and currently what this does is this identifies multi-words based upon solely on the training set itself. So if a word occurs by itself pretty frequently in the training set, it considers that a base word, it creates its own input dictionary on this, so this way it can specifically target languages. Um, and so this is really cool, and this does things, as I said, like kind of like pick up the newest man name or Pokemon or something like that without you having to go ahead and update it yourself. Uh, this is not perfect. This is kind of like it, it still will have false positives. It will still have false negatives. So this will be something that's continuously evolving as well there. Uh, also, the, probably the biggest challenge for this there is for a base word to be identified. It has to uh, occur by itself in the training set. 
so that is also um, can be problematic sometimes. And I can talk about to you afterwards about this too. There's a couple of different uh, tweaks or something like that for common you know words like I love you, uh, you know, or like I love blank uh, that are kind of hard coded in this as well, so that you know it's guaranteed to go ahead and pick those up. So I want to kind of go back in the Wayback Machine, though, for passwords cons. Because this talk here um, uh, by, um, I'm going to get his name wrong, and I apologize, Marcus uh, uh, Dumros, or um, uh, at, at uh, Password Con 2012, this one slide caused me a lot of lost sleep. It really just vexed me. Um, so I want to kind of highlight this a little bit here. But basically, he came out with this thing called Ordered Markov Enumerator, which is a kind of a brute force type of attack. And if we zoom in at the very beginning of the slide, things look great to me. Because I'm used to seeing all my, my tool at the very top, the most effective password cracker out there. Uh, so yeah, if we zoom in at the very beginning. It looks great. OK, I'm top. He, uh, you know, th that's down there at the bottom. Uh, but if you let this kind of run out here, uh, <laughs> it just gets bloody. Um, and I, I don't like that. You know? and, so, and you'll notice that you know, when it's uh, um, it with the PCFG, um, it kind of hits this plateau. It doesn't do very much uh, after that. And that's a problem because, and, and this is a, kind of a known issue with it there, is that if you don't have something in the training set, it would never try in the, uh, when actually cracking the password. So if someone used a, uh, like a slightly different word that was never seen, it would never try that guess. If it tr they used a number, for example, that was never in the tra training set, it would never try that as well. So it would do really good at the beginning. And then, you know, after it's creating all these like, lower and lower probability guesses there, it would just become basically not an effective attack after that point. So that's problematic. Uh, so I've been going uh, ahead and making a lot of changes since 2012. Um, this here is a more recent one by, uh, uh, from Sign's uh, uh, master thesis um, here. Um, and this looks a lot better than me, OK? <laughs> so this is a, you know, pure PCFG uh, versus Omen. Uh, now, this is a short cracking session, though. Uh, but at least I'm on, I'm on the top again there. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I want to be fully honest. If we run this cracking session for much, much longer, the same problem is going to occur. Okay? I'm gonna still going to go ahead and exhaust all, pretty much all the passwords that I saw, you know, combinations I saw in the, uh, the training set there. Um, and people are going to try stuff that just I didn't see at all. So uh, eventually, if you run this longer, Omen will start to catch up and then surpass uh, PCFGs. And once again, that's not acceptable to me. I really want to go ahead and have the best, you know, most accurate password model out there. So I did what any you know, you know, typical academic would, and I went ahead and just kind of stole that idea. <laughs> so I uh, incorporated uh, with uh, one of the, the Omen developers, uh, Maximilian there, um, a P Omen directly into the, the PCFG grammar. And so what this means there is that it will go ahead and swap between your standard, more traditional PCFG attacks and these Omen you know, um, uh, brute force type generated um, uh, guesses there, depending on what the current probability was. Now, in order to do this, I had to go ahead and assign a probability to Omen guesses. So that's what pretty much all this here was, was basically me saying, OK, you know, Omen works on, not on probabilities. It works on these ideas called levels. So you know, it'll have you know, it, like a typical Markov attack. It looks at you know, what letter follows the next letter and it's kind of what happens there. So you know, if you see like J-E-S, uh, the next letter is probably another S for you know, Jesus, of course, or, or, or Jessica, I mean. And the next one would be uh, also U for uh, Jesus, because those are the kind of things that show up very co common in uh, passwords. And then if you get some things like JESM or JES2, they become much, much less uh, probable. So the next thing I needed to do was calculate a key space for each of these def different omen levels. Um, and then I go ahead and I try to see for uh, these omen levels here in the training set how many of the passwords it would crack if you ran it against it for that omen level. And once I have all this information here, I can go ahead and assign a probability to a level uh, based upon each individual guess that it makes. So that way now I have a very fine grained probability assigned to this there, and I know when I start, need to start going ahead and generating guesses versus, with omen versus trying to generate a guess with you know, another method there. And I want to be completely upfront is one of the reasons why I love coming to these password cons here is I'm always looking at other techniques people are proposing as well, because I want to be able to borrow, integrate, and you know, all that stuff in there as well. So um, I'm constantly, you know, I'm very happy when I see more advanced techni techniques come out here in order to be able to kind of integrate it into this tool set. Now, but that being said, if you're actually looking at making use of this tool set here, uh, one really uh, effective feature is to be able to go ahead and disable that whole Omen integration. And there's a couple of reasons why you might want to do this. First of all, you know, PCFG generation is slow. 
So you might want to be able to paralyze the work a little bit. So maybe you have Omen running in you know, one session there, and then you know, a, a normal standard PCFG attack another. So that will allow you to get a little bit more speed up and paralyze that work. Uh, the other thing, though, is that uh, one thing I've been finding, though, is that, and I'll get into this a little bit more later, but uh, finding good training sets is really hard. So a lot of times what will happen is you'll train on passwords where uh, there's no duplicates in the training set. Um, and you'll see this in a lot of dumps because you know, they try to make it smaller. They don't include the username in the password. It's just a draw hash. The hash is not salted. Uh, so you'll only get things like one two, uh, you know, password 123 that show up in your data set once. This is a problem, but you know, um, for longer cracking sessions, uh, it can be overcome a little bit with the PCFG. So it's still sometimes useful to be able to train on these you know, uh, data sets. But unfortunately, OMEN itself really struggles when you train it on data sets that don't have duplicates. Uh, so in that case, um, I recommend turning off uh, OMEN guest generation um, and then running it, you know, OMEN uh, with a, on a a, a, other data set that may not quite uh, closely relate uh, to the, the, the target you're trying to target, uh, but at least it was trained on duplicates. So in order to do that, all you need to do though is just there's a skip brute flag that you can have when you're um, running it. And then when you do that there, it'll skip all the, uh, the brute force guesses. Well, I'm talking about turning off different options too. I might also mention um, you can turn off case smuggling for uh, the PCFG guesser as well. So in order to do that, you just give it the flag all lower and it will no longer do any case smuggling and it will only generate lower case guesses. So the question might be like, why do you want to do that? Um, one option might be that the password hash is case insensitive. I don't really find that's really the case when you're using PCFG attacks though, because if the password hash is case insensitive, it's probably super fast to run and you're running some other attack against it instead. You're not gonna be cracking landman with this uh, you know, tool here. Where I find it much more useful though, is you might have an idea how your target is doing their case mangling because people are very um, individualistic. Or when they pick a case mangling strategy, they tend to follow that. So if potentially you've you know, found out some of your other passwords, you might have an idea how that target is currently going ahead and uh, mangling their, uh, their case. So rather than trying all different case mangling strategies, what you might want to do is only try that specific case mangling strategy. You might want to try to capitalize everything or you know, you only capitalize the first letter, the last letter, or so on. And in that case, um, what you can do, and this is one thing that's really kind of cool that John Ripper supports, is instead of using kind of the STDN uh, tag there, you can use what's uh, a pipe tag instead when you're running uh, in your John Ripper session. And what that allows you to do is then apply additional mangling rules uh, to whatever you're pushing in on input. So that way I can have a traditional John Ripper you know, uh, rule set um, and I can spe manually specify the case mangling rule I want to apply to this here. And then all the guesses I push into this here will be have that, uh, that case mangling rule applied to it there. So I've been talking about the, the Python tool set for a while. Um, and so one really cool thing that kind of happened was uh, I was talking with uh, Adam, the, direct, uh, the creator of Hashcat, and he was interested in incorporating uh, this into Hashcat directly as a slow guess a mode, uh, generating mode, uh, which is awesome. I mean, I'm not gonna say no to that. Uh, the problem though is that Hashcat is not written in Python. Uh, so uh, in order to do this here, I had to go ahead and rewrite the entire uh, guesser in C. And I, hate writing in C, you know? I don't know if I can write a hello world program with about five buffer overflows in a memory leak. Um, so, you know, use this code with, you know, caution too. But, um, so I, I went ahead and did this. Um, and uh, currently, um, uh, it's, it's working actually pretty good. It doesn't have all the features of the Python tool set. And I always expect the Python tool set is gonna be a little bit more feature rich than the C one, simply because I, I, I enjoy writing in Python there. And so I'll generally probably go ahead and implement that there instead of uh, this. So if you want to actually get this working, I, I really recommend contacting me first because it is a little bit temperamental. You know, whenever you get compiled code running on random computers it, you know, that are not mine, you know, it, it just behaves a little bit differently. But to try and make it a little bit easier though, I am using kind of a modified version of Hashcat's make file. So if you can build Hashcat on your computer, you at least have a fighting chance of being able to build this as well. Um, but I've really only uh, tested this so far in Ubuntu or Ubuntu, uh, you know, uh, running on w Windows subsystem for Linux. So that way I can run it on this uh, uh, laptop right here too. <coughs> and then also, I'm never going to go ahead and have the, the, uh, the machine learning portion that goes ahead and generates these rule sets written in C. I, there's just too many nice things in Python there for me to go ahead and make that transition. So it's always, you're always going to have to go ahead and use the, uh, the, the trainer that's found in the, um, uh, the, the, the Python tool set in order to generate new rule sets. 
Now, a couple other you know, disadvantages, since I do eventually want to make use of uh, hashcat functionality versus having to develop myself. Uh, but in the C, compiled C version, there is no uh, session save and restore. So once you kill it off, it's gone. You got to start over from scratch again. There's also no status outputs because I want to be able to make use of hashcat status outputs. And I haven't even gone ahead and implemented open guest generation in it yet either there. So those are some limitations. So the question was all those limitations and the, you know, how hard it is to get to install and run. Like why would you bother with this? And I personally have to say, I'm using this now mostly uh, versus the Python tool set. And the reason for that this is about 20 times faster than the Python tool set. And I always knew that Python was slow and C was fast. But when I saw that, I was like, holy crap. You know, I, I was not expecting that big of a, a speed up there. Uh, so um, uh, if you need to be able to crack faster uh, you know, uh, hashes, um, I would highly recommend going ahead and doing this uh, instead. So I've been talking a little bit about guest generation, but now I want to kind of get into the kind of the other side of things here of how do we go about training these rule sets. So there's a lot of different reasons why you would want to go ahead and create a custom rule set for your target. Um, so probably the, the number one uh, thing is that you know language and country pay, plays a large role in password creation. Now at least for um, um, most uh, you know non uh, Mandarin speakers. The, the actual mangling rules they do are, seem to be fairly the same to me, but at least the base words that they're choosing there are going to be very different. Uh, so being able to uh, you know, kind of customize that is really nice. And there's been some academic papers there that you know, show that you do you know, pretty good, even if you, you know, use like Rocky against you know, a, you know, um, a different data set like Japanese. Um, um, you, can you can do better if you train it really on you know, you know, Japanese passwords. Um, also, a big thing is that corporate password creation policies or password creation strategies tend to be a little bit different than what you see on websites. So if you're attacking corporate passwords, you probably want to go be able to train on corporate passwords first there because people have a tendency that, you know, with password change rules and complexity rules and stuff like that, they're to do a little bit more than they do for their social networking. So, the other kind of reasons why you might want to be able to do this is you're trying to target a specific password creation policy. So for example, if you train on Rocky, there's no real password creation policy in that at all. But you might be trying to target passwords that have to be at least you know, 14 characters long or have a special character in them or have, must have a uh, uppercase char uh, character as well. So you might want to only train on passwords that possess the characteristics that you're actually looking to be able to target. Now, you can also go ahead and manually edit the, these rules files by hand. I made sure not to include any sort of you know, checksum or CRC value or anything else in the, these as well, because it's really nice to be able to kind of go in, open up the text editor, and just go ahead and say, I really want to go ahead and make this mangling rule um, uh, specifically for whatever target I'm doing as well. And part of my to-do list is to be able to instead of having to open up a, a, you know, a, you know, a, a text editor, is it provides some sort of like standardized GUI uh, for people to be able to use as well for this here. But that's, uh, you know, I haven't done that yet. Um, so the other kind of option here, and this is kind of highlighted um, in some of the talks here, is that this is really nice for being able to analyze current password dumps as well. So I might not be trying to go ahead and crack passwords with this here, but I might be just be trying to figure out, you know, what are the statistics around this password dump? You know, how common are some of these words? You know, uh, what are some of the common mangling rules that they do? Where did this dump come from? And this is a really good uh, usage for this as well. So you can run this on current password dumps that you're, you know, cracking uh, or that you've obtained, and it can give you a lot of information uh, into about what those dumps, you know, are. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with hashes.org. Uh, this is a, a great and wonderful site. Uh, there's a lot of different password hashes uh, available on that there. Uh, but there's a lot of challenges when you want to go ahead and train on these data sets. So let's say um, you want to go ahead and, you know, um, uh, this has a you know, bunch of different leaks on it there. So you can grab them. You have a general idea of where they came from, which is kind of nice as well. So like, let's say we try to do this like, uh, I'm going to say it wrong. Like, I'm not, I'm not even trying to say it. But it's uh, basically a. Um, a Chinese website for graduates who are looking to be able to get new jobs. So that seems like a very interesting target demographic that you might want to go ahead and create a, you know, a password cracking uh, rule set um, in order to target there. So if you do this from hashes.org, um, the first thing is that you want to go ahead and train on only the plain text passwords. So don't go ahead and download like the hash pairs because it's going to think that the hash is part of the password and then it's just going to generate garbage. Uh, so um, that's pretty much the, the, the first thing you really need to be able to do. The big problem with most of these data sets, though, 
is that they do not contain duplicates. And as I said earlier, duplicates are really important, especially for the very beginning of a password cracking session. Because if you don't have duplicates, it's not going to know that 123456 is a really common password. It's just going to look like a random number. Um, so um, it really helps to have duplicates in your data set. So if you can get a data set that actually does contain duplicates, you're going to do much better. That being said, as a password cracking session goes longer, um, that becomes less important. Um, because, and you probably already cracked one, two, three, four, five, six using a different cracking session anyway. Uh, so being able to kind of get some of those base words and you know extract it out and really kind of target towards your audience um, is actually still it still can be useful in order to train on a password lists that only contain you know unique passwords. Now another problem when you try train on these you know data sets though is it only contains cracked passwords. You're not trained on the passwords that you haven't cracked, and those are the passwords you really often care about there. Uh, so it's a little bit like drinking your own bath water when it comes to you know, training on a current cracking session uh, and then trying to rerun the cracking session against it there. Um, so it really helps to be able to train on data sets to have a high completion rate of uh, cracked uh, passwords. Or plain text passwords are actually the best. So in order to use a trainer, uh, it's also part of the, the Python tool set. Um, it's called trainer.py. Uh, and basically you, you give it a name that you want to call the rule set there. And then you also give it you know, the tr password training set that you want to be able to run it on as well. And it basically runs a, a bunch of different things here. Um, and the first thing I really want to kind of talk about, though, is that encoding is really important. Now, by default, it'll try to auto-detect the encoding um, of the training set that you're, you're learning on. Um, but um, you can manually specify this as well if you are absolutely sure that you know the encoding that you want. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is by default, usually UTF is probably pretty good for a lot of different web uh, 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 passwords if you're trying to crack those. Uh, but when you start trying to track, crack things like file encryption, uh, a lot of times the, uh, the encoding for those will sometimes be you know, whatever is set up on that, their local computer there. Uh, so you want to be able to target that specifically. In order to do that, you need to be able to train on a, a data training set that's of the same encoding type. So as I kind of mentioned a little bit earlier, um, Password encoding is a pain in the butt. I try to automate a lot of it as possible. It's still going to be uh, a problem, uh, but at least hopefully this is helping a little bit out with uh, being able to deal with some of these encoding issues there. So this runs three different passes through the train set, so it takes a little bit of time. Uh, the first through the pass through the train set, it learns the character frequency analysis and tries to figure out what the base words are for the multi-word uh, uh, guessing. And so this goes through pretty fast. Um, especially um, if you're only dealing with like a couple, uh, you know, million passwords. When you start trying to feed a billion passwords through this, it takes a lot longer. Uh, and, the, the, you know, it keep, tries to basically keep everything in memory too, so it'll start using up even more memory as it goes ahead and starts passing through that there. So the one real main requirement when you do this though, is you need, do need to be able to fit the entire password data set that you're training on in memory uh, in your computer. So when you start dealing with these you know, terabyte you know, d dumps of you know, cracked passwords, you may not want to try, try to train on the full thing there. You might want to try only a subset of the passwords. <coughs> the second pass through uh, does most of the real parsing that we think about. So it goes ahead and you know, assigns probabilities and numbers to case mangling, to kind of masks um, uh, within the keyboard walks and so on. And then the third pass through is really just for omen there. So it goes ahead and tries to assign probabilities to different omen levels uh, based upon the information that it's learned. So after it does this though, it displays data about the data sets. And I'm still adding to this here of stuff that I find useful personally when I just want to be able to look at this data set and try to figure out where it came from. So for example, it'll like, uh, po uh, post out the top five URL domains. Uh, like the, the top ones will almost always be uh, we uh, webmail accounts, so you can kind of ignore those. But what kind of falls underneath those there uh, is you know, often the, side, the, 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 the site that the passwords were extracted from because people always use you know, the site names and their passwords there. Also, um, it uh, parses out dates too. Oh, sorry, I didn't. Uh, so it'll kind of like list which years it's not finding most common in the, uh, the data set as well. Because that's uh, pretty easy to be able, or nice to be able to figure out, you know, maybe when this data set got released. Now, there's a long tail. The current year is almost never the top most probably year because people create their passwords beforehand and they use that year. So you're really only seeing people who create passwords recently for the most current year. But you can kind of look at that to guess, like, okay, you know, Rock U, uh, which is the, the data set here, 2008, uh, that's when it got, uh, you know, um, uh, released. So one final thing I kind of really want to talk about, though, is 
PCFT attacks are slow, so it'd be really nice to be able to use this data in other cracking techniques. So uh, who here knows about the Prince attack? And um, for, is it integrated directly into Hashcat, or you have to use a preprocessor for, uh, you know, or directly integrated in John Ripper, you have to use a preprocessor in Hashcat. Um, it's a really nice cracking mode. And basically what it does, it just combines um, all the different words in the input dictionary together, and then hopefully you can crack some passwords with it. And uh, it's really fast, and that's a huge advantage for that there. And it actually does a pretty decent job of cracking passwords. But the big problem with Prince attacks is generating those input dictionaries in the first place, because the success of your Prince attack is really going to depend on how good that input dictionary is. Because you need to both have words that you would uh, you know, expect to be able to build upon in uh, order to do that, but you also need a lot of for lack of a better term, junk in your data set or your, your, your set as well. So it'll do things like you know append an 11 to the back of a password or append a special character. So if you create a you know um, a Prince input dictionary that doesn't have all those values, um, it's never going to try them, and you're not going to crack a lot of passwords. The problem with a combinator attack, though, is that the, every single you know additional field that you add to that input dictionary there. You know, exponentially increases the uh, the number of guesses you're going to have to make. So it's really a hard judge of be able to make up an input dictionary to be you know contain all the junk that you want in order to be able to make an effective crack crack attack, but not too much junk. So that way you never actually get around to cracking the passwords that you want. So since I have all this probability information though, uh, I can make you know kind of really nice bespoke you know dictionaries to be able to use in a Prince attack there. So I'll go ahead and it'll include a number of you know big words there and a, a bunch of uh, the smaller probability or smaller ones as well. And it'll only include the top X most uh, probable uh, uh, values into this as well. So you can specify how big you want your Prince input dictionary to be. I've been finding that you know, 100,000 words is probably you know, kind of a sweet spot for um, being able to make a lot of guesses and having high accuracy. But you can really leverage that. So if you have a big GPU farm, you might want to have a really big input dictionary. So you can specify this here. So in order to be able to generate this here, um, basically there's another tool in the tool set called princeling.py. So you can run it, you can see the help thing, and you can go ahead and generate these dictionaries there. But the reason why I really want to focus on this first of all the different cracking attacks, though, is because Prince really is kind of like the lazy man's attack. Like, trying to crack passwords is actually, it's, it's, it, it takes a lot of effort if you really want to cu craft a customized attack there. You know, you have to look at you know, your target, you have to be able to monitor cracking sessions, see how you're doing, all sort of stuff there. And sometimes you just want to be able to go out and have a drink and see, you know, whatever. So Prince attacks, generally, that's the type of attack you want to be able to kind of just throw onto your computer, keep those GPUs running, and then kind of walk off and still actually have a semi-effective attack there. So the problem with that, though, is I was talking about the input dictionary. It was a big pain in the butt to be able to always kind of worry about how to craft these input dictionaries here. So this just makes it a little bit easier. So that way, Prince attacks really can. You can just kind of like, OK, it's quitting time. Launch a Prince, you know, create a custom dictionary, launch a Prince attack, um, and run it. Uh, the other thing is it's really, Prince attacks are actually pretty nice when you are going ahead and you have a crack list from the current set as well. So you, you look at like you may have only cracked 40% you know, of the passwords. Let's go ahead, you know, train it, create a custom input dictionary, and then launch a Prince attack with that there. And I'm hoping to be able to do this similar for other types of rules as well. Um, but that's kind of an ongoing project for mine to be able to create things like, you know, customized case mangling rules or customized, rule, uh, you know, you know um, normal dictionary rules as well. So that's pretty much it here. Does anyone have any questions? And